Lori Houston's News for the Heart is dedicated to helping you give a voice to your own soul. Our hearts have the power to free us from pain and the struggles that keep us from awakening to our true essence. Join Lori now as we delve into our heart and soul to find the path that will open us to the possibilities and lead us to the life we love to live. And good afternoon. This is News for the Heart. And today, like I do it at the end of every month, as long as Tom's not away, <laughs> I have Tom Campbell with me. This is going to be an interesting show because I've got some feedback from some stuff that's been happening with me. And we've got some questions from our listeners, which I always appreciate and, you know, am honored that, uh, that they take the time and connect with us. And we want to hear what you guys have to say. So please just keep sending them and we'll keep answering them as long as they have to do with my end, which is more looking at the practical applications of Tom's work versus, you know, the really scientific stuff. Save those for <laughs> his his work that he does all the time um, because that will just go right over my head. And well, maybe not right over my head, but it won't. It will I always want to bring it back to the practical? So if it's really sciencey um, based, then uh, check it out his forums and go on there and ask the questions there. Um, as you know, Tom and I, I love having Tom on the show. We do really resonate in a nice place. And we talk about how we can make his work practical and how that's done. Um, I have a great example of today. So um, I wanted to bring it up just because, um, and we've been talking about it for years and I finally really, it just really clicked in nicely so that I was able to, um, to really hold some of the truth of what we've been talking about and sharing for the past few years. Um, but welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you, Lori. Always glad to be here. It's always fun to uh, kind of walk on the personal side and the application exactly. side for a while and not always be on the science side. So exactly. I, I'm glad to be here. Right. Me too. And we always get so many great comments on our videos. So we do appreciate all that everybody is sending. So this past month, I was really able to see how when someone gets triggered or when someone, um, you know, has this emotional charge that happens, how we automatically focus that emotional charge or that trigger to me. So it's like anything that happens, no matter what it is, we pull it into our own story. We pull it into um, this pattern and we focus on me. And I was really able to see how beneficial if we were able to just sort of pull back from the me, pull back from that initial reaction. I think honestly, until we completely heal, you know, some of those, these core wounds or these sacred wounds that we have, we'll, we're always going to have that initial charge or that initial reaction or emotional reaction that we have. And if we can, as soon as we start to feel that, if we can just sort of step back from that and then allow the person in front of you, which is usually what it is, because it's usually around relationships. And I'm not just talking about intimate relationships. It can be any relationship, colleagues at work, friends, neighbors, uh, someone behind you in the grocery line. But if we can just sort of get out of our own story or that own, that first initial charge, and then just sort of hold space, we can really see the truth in what's sort of occurring around us. And usually if you get triggered, then the other person is triggered and it, it's this back and forth and both people are trying to justify why they're feeling what they're feeling. And both people are getting too engaged in that angst or in that emotion. And they're not being able to look at other. They're not being able to hold that space because it doesn't really matter what that other person, how that other person is triggering you because it doesn't have anything to do with them. But if you can step back from that and hold that space, it just, it opens up everything around you instead of you getting caught up in your own stuff and going me, 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 me. Well, this person did this to me and da, 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 da. You can really 
really come from a different place. So I, I was just so thrilled <laughs> when I was able to actually, I don't know, just sort of disengage from that emotional connection and just sort of process and, you know, hold the space for the other person. It really allowed all of the, what could have been a difficult situation to just, you know, be nothing. Yes, that happens a lot. You know, we had we have this uh, phrase about having a chip on your shoulder. Mm. Uh, that means you just very quickly um, get defensive and very quickly, you know, ready to fight and scrap at almost anything, you know, that kind of thing. But and that's associated with be, with having uh, having uh, let's say some sense of of insecurity, but that's not quite the word uh, inadequacy, some sort of vulnerability. When you feel that that maybe you're not doing it as well as you should, or that other people think you should do more, and you you have that sense of of a uh, little chip on the shoulder, you know, that you feel like maybe you are under the gun or somebody's criticizing you. Well, you jump to that conclusion when you hear them say something and they may just be stating a fact they may not be being critical of you at all and it comes it comes to mind was a a, a lady who was giving a, a a talk and she was talking about uh, communication and she told a story on herself that uh, you know she was at home doing work she had the kitchen table all piled up with her documents and she had been working hard on this thing for a long time and of course, because of that, she was feeling a little guilty that she wasn't keeping up with other things mm -hmm. that she used to do around the house and whatever. So she'd been doing this for some weeks and the husband comes in, looks in the refrigerator and says, there's no baloney in the refrigerator. <laughs> and she immediately goes off and proceeds to explain to him why she is not his maid. And if he wants baloney, he can damn well. I'll go to the store and buy bologna himself. And, you know, so she's giving him all of this grief. And that's because she felt guilty. inadequate. She felt guilty. She felt that she wasn't doing what she should. And because of that, she took that there's no bologna in the refrigerator as a criticism of her, that she had failed. It was her job to do the shopping, which maybe that's what she normally did. And she got very angry when he made that comment. And the reason she was telling the story was because she said, and then her husband said, well, I just wanted you to know in case, you know, it means something to you, you know, it's just stating a fact. There is no baloney in the refrigerator and that's all I meant. Just, a, you know, it, it, what didn't have anything to do with her. He was just out loud kind of saying what came into his mind when he looked in the refrigerator. He wasn't criticizing her at all. And she realized that. And then she realized that that was her problem, not his problem. And you're saying something very similar that stems from, from feeling, feeling inadequate, inadequate, feeling like you're not as much as you should be, feeling uh, insecure. Then when you hear things, you tend to jump to the conclusion that it's about you. Mm -hmm. And it's not only about you, it's being critical of you. It's saying something, it's trying to order you around or tell you what you need to do or somehow somebody's treading on you. Well, that's back to the old chip on the shoulder. And when you feel insecure, vulnerable, guilty, you know, uh, inadequate, all those things, then you have this little chip on your shoulder. And when somebody says something, you tend to take it as a, as a hostile comment. And then you react to it as if it was a hostile comment. And the other person's going like, what's that all about? You know, why telling me that I can damn well go buy my own baloney? And I just <laughs> made a statement. So then that person starts to get surly exactly. because they've just been attacked. Exactly. You see? And they say, well, you know, what do you mean I can go buy my own baloney? You know, what? A, you know, and then they'll come back with something. And then that turns into a fight, a problem. When the fact was there really was nothing to fight about at all. It was just a statement made that when one, particularly guys do this, you know, they, they just talk what they, what they see and how they feel at the moment. Sometimes they just say it. And it wasn't an attribution of responsibility at all. So right. that's and maybe, the kind of thing you're talking about, I think. That yeah, happens exactly. so much and it tends to be a men are for Mars, women are for Venus kind of problem. Right. Because women are 
they're they're kind of the masters of the relationship area arena that's what they do yeah. and relationship is never very factual thing it's all intuitive <laughs> and it all is kind of reading the signs and making assumptions and guessing because you never have a whole lot of facts there okay and if they tend to say something if they come out in their intellect and say and want to announce that there's no baloney there's usually a reason they're only going to say that if they think somebody else needs to hear it you see but so when they hear their husband say that then they think it's the same way the only reason he's saying that is because he thinks somebody needs to hear it and who else is in the room but them therefore they take it personally because they don't say things and let to people in relationship unless there's some connection to be made so the ladies tend to be more manipulative in the sense not in a negative sense but just in if i do this it'll cause that or i say things because i think certain people need to hear that that way and they do relationship from their intellect right guys don't you see so for the guy it didn't have anything to do with relationship <laughs> he was just stating a fact and saying it out loud and he didn't actually mean that it was anybody would particularly do anything about it it was just an announcement if you will you see but ladies will take it the way ladies would do it and if they did it that's the way they would have done it it would have had a purpose not just a statement of fact mm. ladies don't go around just making statements of fact because that doesn't work in relationship business they have a they have a you know a point that they're making so it's kind of a male female dichotomy in the way men are and the way ladies are and then to that if the lady tends to be feeling you know, a little uh, insecure or inadequate or guilty as this lady was feeling because she'd been working and hadn't been doing the things she used to do, then that immediately somebody is criticizing you. Yeah. Well, you're busy, you have this job, you know, you're bringing home money and whatever, and now they're criticizing you for not also doing all your other stuff, you know, and now that's unfair and that just isn't right. So then you need to, you know, fight back or, you know, you get upset and angry. So it's just miscommunications. It's right. just, yeah, making up your own story. You yeah. internalize all this stuff, and it creates so much of the, of the, uh, I don't know, the discomfort and the pro the angst in a relationship is just that. It's over things that don't actually even exist. And you said if you could back up a little bit and get some space and just kind of let that go, that maybe you could see that. It's your conclusion that you jump to that the husband said that because he thinks you failed in your job. But that may not be true at all. All you have to do is ask a question or make a statement like, um, yeah, I haven't been able to get to the store. Maybe you'll have to go because, you know, I'm really you know, busy here. I got to get this out in the next couple of days and see how he react to that. And if he says, oh, sure, or yeah, whatever. Oh, I don't care. I really don't need any baloney. I just let you know that there wasn't any in the refrigerator, you know, that sort of thing. Then you realize it's not really that he's upset with you for failing. It's just something else. It's just a statement, you see. So just ask a question rather than jump immediately into the assumption that somebody has just, you know, pushed your button. It's just triggered mm -hmm. your whatever, you know, let these triggers go. Deal with the real world not with the fantasy world that is in your imagination, that is your assumption. Live in the real world. And in the real world, to know why somebody said something, just ask. <laughs> oh dear, why did you say that? And you say, well, I just thought you might wanna know. <laughs> then let it go, you see. Now, if he says, well, that's because you failed and I wanted you to know that you had failed. Well, now that's something else. Maybe you do need to have a little, you know, talk around that because that's an issue. But most of the time, it's not even an issue. It's just our ego gets all wrapped up around us and our hurt and our insecurity. And we're not perfect. We're not doing what we should do. But we want to be perfect. And we don't want people not to like us and think that we're not doing what we should do. We're very sensitive what other people think about us because we're not too secure. We don't have a lot of confidence. And there we go. You see, yeah. now we interpret lots of things in our world as being aggressive to us, as being pushy, as being inconsiderate. 
and that sort of thing. And we feel ourselves as, oh, whoa, poor little me. I always have to put up with this crap. You know, I always have to put up with this junk from, from people. And mostly that junk and crap is all in your mind. You're making it up. It doesn't even really exist in the minds of those other people. Sometimes it does, but you won't really know unless you ask a question or unless you just let it go. And even if you don't ask the question and say, well, that's, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take that bait. You know, it's all right. right. I know I'm busy. I'm doing what I have to do and I'm just going to do it. So it's okay with me, no matter how he feels, you know, if he thinks I should go out and do it and I'm busy, well, I'm busy. See, now that's just confidence. You don't have to defend yourself because you're comfortable with who you are and what you're doing and you know, you're doing what you have to do. And then if somebody else says, well, I think you failed to do this. You just kind of ignore it one in, in one ear and out the other because you're confident that what you're doing is what you need to be doing and that they just don't understand. And there's no need in fighting with them about that. Exactly. Let it go. You see, so that's the other way to handle it. But a lot of the time it wasn't even a, it wasn't even a, a uh, criticism in the first place. That's the, that's what we talk about triggers. See, these triggers are our ego. These triggers are us feeling inadequate, us being vulnerable to not being perfect. Oh, I didn't do what I should do. I'm not the perfect person. <laughs> you see, ladies get this idea they need to be perfect because they are about their relationships and they need to be perfect in their relationships. They need not to do things in their relationships that are harmful or, you know, not right or inadequate or insecure. You know, they don't want to do any of that. They want to be perfect. And when somebody tells them that they're, they're not, not perfect, perfect that, that they screwed up or didn't do something, well, that's the, that's a trigger point. See, now that is kind of calling them out on that uh, ego that they're wrapped up in. And right away, they tend to snap. You know, they're going to snap back. They're going to bark. They're going to fuss about it. And that's just a, the wrong thing to do. Even if that husband was trying to tell her, that she had failed in her duty to keep baloney in the refrigerator. There's no point in her getting upset about it. Right. She might as well just let it go and maybe, or say something gentle like, well, you know, I've been very busy. So, you know, that's sometimes some things will have to fall through the cracks. If I'm going to make my deadline here that I have to make, and you're going to have to, you know, pick up the slack however you can or do without. <laughs> that's just the way it is and not feel bad about that. Just accept that yeah. that's the way it is. You see, but if you don't have confidence, then you have this little chip on your shoulder. And when you do, that's a, that's what you're calling a trigger. Right. It's that ego. It's a, that's the problem. And it's a, it's a real big, um, I don't know, cause of damage in relationships. It really, it really is. It really is. <laughs> really is. All right. So let's go into our question. So this is a good question. It, it kind of talks about how we say, you know, we're not really in control of things that are happening. So let go of trying to control things, be in charge of your emotions, but let go of being in control and then bring into that setting intentions. And so how does so how do you, I guess, let go? Once you set an intention, it's sort of focusing energy to, to a specific place. So if you're working on intentions and how you want to focus your energy, how do you then not, and I believe this is part of the question, how do you not, um, how do you let go of being in control of it or, or being in charge of your emotions? Does that... Is that clear? No. Okay. So let's, okay. So we talk about it, how it's good to set intentions so that it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, it focuses our energy and it moves us right. towards a certain place and it gives mm -hmm. us, whether it's a goal emotionally or spiritually or whatever. But we also talk about, and I guess this is why the confusion is there. And I think it's a good one because I think a lot of people get confused. We also talk about letting go, like don't focus on the outcome, let go. Don't, don't try to control mm -hmm. everything. I see. So mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Those two tend seem to be um, at odds with each other. Exactly. And one of them says, you know, if you want to change, you have to have an intention. 
Okay. If you want to do something, if you want to take action, you need an intention. Yes. And otherwise, you just sit there and you know, your intention is like your your motivation, your desire, your drive. Uh, it's it's what you want to accomplish or what you want to do, and or what you want to become. You know, it's an an intention for things to happen or to be in a certain way. So that's kind of our guidance. If we didn't have intention, we'd kind of sit, you know, and just become a lump, you know, someplace, and we really wouldn't be able to do anything. We wouldn't have any motivation. So we need intention to get us going. And the other one is um, don't control, don't try to control everything. Don't try to control the outcome. Uh, just let things go, let things happen. And when things happen, you get to deal with them the way they happen, but don't try to make things happen in a particular way. You know, just accept life as it is, accept people as they are and deal with it with love and caring and cooperation. And that's a good thing to do. Okay, so those are the two I did. And both of those are true. Right. Okay, so why do they, why do they sometimes seem to conflict? Right. Well, one is the intention isn't really setting a goal for the most part. It's okay. not like this is the end point of what I want to happen. When we say have an intention, when we're talking about um, an action, you know, what it's more of the path, not the not the end point. It's more of the of the journey, not the destination. The intention is about, you know, I want to be more caring. I want to be more aware of other people. I want more empathy. Okay, now that's a that's kind of a thing in process. That's not a goal. I mean, you might think of it's a goal. I want to be that, but the way we apply that is, we want we start to care more about other people, what they think and how they feel. And it's an ongoing thing. It's a way of being, not so much a, I want to, I want to move my entropy from, you know, 3.7 to, you know, 4.2. See, that would be a goal. We don't look at it that way. We look at it as it's just a process that I need to work on. Okay. I would like to be more caring. I would like uh, to not get angry. I would like to get rid of some of my trigger points. I got so many trigger points. I'd like to eliminate some of those trigger points. Just get rid of them. Okay. Now these are like processes in work and that's sort of what we need with, with our intention. If we use our intention, say to get data out of a database, then we have an intention on the information that we would like to have. And that's also an intention. Okay, but that is not really in conflict with things happen. Things happen in spite of our intentions. Whatever our intentions are, things happen. We're not in control of the universe. You know, we are. We do not live at the center of the universe, and the universe does not evolve around us. And stuff happens, and no matter what our intentions are, and when that stuff happens, we just need to deal with it. We need to not say, "Oh, that's not the stuff I wanted to happen." There's a problem here. You see, that's yeah. that's you wanting to have controlled it and you and you didn't control it. And what, what was I missing? How could I have manipulated that better? See, that's not such a good idea. The better idea is stuff happens. How do I deal with it? So you accept things that happen and you also have intentions of, you know, how you would like to become, things you'd like to do, information you'd like to get, how you be. That's our that's our direction. You know, our our intentions set our direction. Where are we headed and kind of why are we going there and what's the point anyway? You know, why, why am I going there? So this is an intent. And at the same time, stuff happens, <laughs> whether you intend, like I say, whether it's your intent or not, doesn't matter. You're in a multiplayer game with hundreds of other people and you can't control their free will. So you have to deal with that free will and don't try to control it. Don't try to control people in the way they are. Don't try to force people to understand things the way you understand them. Just let people be the way they are and deal with them in a very positive way. So those two things aren't really incompatible, but I can see that the words can be confusing because one of them is saying, just let go. And the other one is saying, no, intend a particular <laughs> thing. But yeah. it's, it's a difference in the way we're applying. Don't intend that the future has to be the way you want it. You see, now that's depending on an end on an end goal. I want people right. to do this. I want people to do that. I want this thing to happen and that thing to happen. And now that intention 
generally leads to action of manipulation, control. You try to control it to make those kinds of things happen. Okay. So the intention that I'm talking about isn't that you're trying to control things to happen, is that you, you're trying to access things, you're trying to grow. It's not a matter of control. You have to have the, the intent to do it, but it has to happen. You're not forcing it. So you can't really force data out of the database. You just ask, you can't force yourself to be more sincere or less angry or fewer trigger points. You can't demand that or manipulate it. It just has to happen, but it won't happen if you don't have an intent. Mm -hmm. See, you're not really manipulating or taking control of that. The intent's just setting the direction and the, you know, there's really no control there. It's not a, it's not a control thing. You're not control. Now, if you do control it, if you say, okay, I'm going to control my anger. Every time I get angry, I'm going to swallow it. I'm just not going to say anything. When I feel angry, my lips will be pressed together and not a <laughs> word will pass and I won't act angry. Matter of fact, I'll train myself. Whenever I feel angry, I will keep my mouth shut and smile. That's just what I'll do, you see. Well, now you are manipulating. And now that is a thing where you're trying to control. It's manipulating. It's being inauthentic and it's not good. It's not helpful. But if you'd say, I really don't want to be angry. My intention is that I just don't get angry because my ego just right. isn't attached to things having to be a certain way. So when they're not that way, you know, I just won't get angry because I'm not attached to it. Well, now that's an intention to grow toward. That's good. So there are two different things there. There's a difference between control and intention. An intention isn't an intent to control. <laughs> it's, an, it's an intent to to be, you know, it's, it's a guidance of how you're going to go and how you're going to approach things and, and how you'd like to grow up. It's not a, a control thing. You're not forcing those things because if you are forcing them and controlling, like just smiling whenever you feel angry, well, you're not growing up any, that's not helping you. It's helping all the people around you because now they don't have to put up with your anger, but they feel that anger in there anyway. Even if you sit and smile, they can feel that anger and it pretty much works out the same way, although you don't get into as many arguments, but still you're seething yeah. inside and that makes it worse because without expression, it tends to build up and build up until pretty soon you pop and go into some sort of a super angry mode where you're angry with everybody, you know, and uh, that's not helpful. You don't want to just stuff things under the rug and not deal with them. So it's not about action. It's about mm -hmm. just being, meeting life and being who you are. And if you don't like that, well, then intend to be different. But that's not a control. Don't control yourself to be different. Be different. Right. That's that's sort of the difference between those. I think there's a lot of confusion around the law of attraction. I know we talk about this every once in a while, but you know, where you're to focus on, you know, the new house or, you know, the fast new car or, you know, that when the secret came out, it, it was very kind of greed oriented and very focused on, you know, Stuff. positive thoughts and yeah very yeah. much things outside of yourself versus yeah. you know working on ourselves to grow um yeah so i think people get confused about you know they, they do is that but you know you know the thing is that that the law of attraction or it is based in in fact in the sense that we do modify future probability with our intent but it has for that to be very powerful for it to work for it to actually modify future probability with uh with any um assurity that intent has to be out of the being level it has mm -hmm. to be uh focused it has to be kind of a um i don't know uh, i guess being level is the best way i can say it you know it has to be a thing out of your core it can't be just a wish Right. You can't be, I sure would like a faster car. I sure would like a prettier girlfriend. I sure would like a lot of money in the bank. So I want it. So I'm going to think about having it all the time because that would, you know, that would make my life easy. There's almost no power in that. Right. That's just an ego whining about the things it would like to have. And whining egos don't have much power. That's about as powerless as you can get. So even to get that new Mercedes Benz in your garage, 
it has to be, the intent has to come at a level much different than just your ego whining. That's a very low power intent. It has to come out of a, a kind of a, a deep level. And if it's always about stuff, you know, about you aggrandizing your ego. Oh, now I have a Mercedes Benz. I'd really be cool. You know, I'd have the only one on the block and everybody would think I was great. That gets in the way. That's ego. Yeah. And the ego tends to weaken your intent. If it's an ego based intent, it's a very weak intent. That's more like a wish. It's not really the kind of intent that modifies future probability very well. So the people who see it as a getting stuff because yes. their ego would like to have the stuff, well, it just never seems to work for them very well because they're approaching it through ego and ego is a very weak player in the, in the um, ability to modify future probability. It has to come from a deeper place. It has to come from kind of the, the level of, you know, we might say the level of soul, you know, it has to come from that sort of place. And from that sort of place, that's not where the ego is. See, yeah. That's outside the ego. That's a different place. That's almost a spiritual space. Is where and that the soul comes from. really is not going to care about the Mercedes or the really exactly. large house. <laughs> it's really not going to care about any of that. Right. So you see, those two are kind of incompatible. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it, um, uh, it needs to come out of that deeper level where the Mercedes Benz really did not any interest. If, <laughs> yeah. if it's, if it's the stuff you want, you're pretty much coming out of your ego yeah. and your ego is a weak player. If it's something more significant to your growth and to life and you know, something like that. Now you have a lot more traction in because now it's coming out of a stronger, more powerful place and that's why sometimes this law of attraction seems to work very, very well and sometimes it doesn't. So you can get people who can train themselves with practice to have their wants come out of that deeper place, but they have to not do it because of ego. There has to be some other sense driving that besides that would make me cool because if that's their sense, they're not going to be successful. Honestly, I think most of the people that were successful in the law of attraction from the movie were because they were teaching other people to do the law of attraction instead of actually being the law of attraction. They're, you know what I was saying? They're, yeah, mm -hmm. they kind of did it the by by teaching other people and charging a lot of money to teach them how to do it instead of actually. But you know, that's just a. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's because it doesn't work very well because right. it's incompatible. Right, you see, and they're it has not teaching come... all of the all of the pieces. The pieces aren't all there by by just looking outside yourself. That's those aren't the pieces that we need. No. Right. <laughs> all right. So I think that's I think that answers that question. Now we got a question around crying and ego, and specifically, um, this was. I mean, I, I kind of corresponded a little bit so I could get clearer. This, specifically, this was around, you know, people crying at funerals. And of course, there are different cultures <laughs> that are much more passionately um, connected when, when, there's, when there's something grieving that they're doing. And we, we've probably all seen those types of um, funerals. But I mean, for me, when I think of grieving, I think, you know, it's an authentic place. Obviously, it, it is ego, but it comes, at least we're being authentic and not kind of stuffing down um, an emotion that we really need to deal with. Like it's, you know, if, if we hide behind all of our emotions, we're not, we're not growing up either because we're, we're, just, um, we're just stuffing them down into our unconscious and at a later date, we'll have to deal with them or, or not, but it's not helping us grow by not honoring um, some of this. But I do understand that, you know, there are some that kind of go way overboard um, with their grieving process and are much more emotional than others. Um, but okay, so we sort of discussed this a little bit before the show. So you now offer your, what you see in crying around okay. funerals. Okay, well, grieving and crying at funerals, we'll just kind of all wrap that up in grieving. Yeah. Even if it isn't a funeral and even if you're not crying, you know, it can still be, you know, the grieving, <laughs> yes. the grieving process. 
that tends to be ego because it's about your loss. Yeah. People who are upset and crying um, tend to be crying because now their life is different. Now they won't have this person in their life anymore. So it's about their loss, about them. And when it's about you, that's ego. You know, that's that's the woe is me. Life is different. I didn't want this change. I don't like this change. I want it to be the way it was before. Uh, you know, I don't want to do this change. What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? Everything's different now. Uh, it's, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and you can feel that way about other people. Oh, no, you know, Susie had three little children. She got run over by a bus. Oh, no, that's so sad. What, you know, what's going to happen to those children? And then, and then you can get upset over that. Uh, that still is about you, your feeling. Yeah. Things aren't the way you want them to be. So you might think, well, that's really about Susie. That's about others. No, it's about you. Life is a way you don't want it to be, and that upsets you. You see, and that's ego. But grieving is not a problem. You know, it's not an ego problem. Ego becomes a problem when it is kind of, you know, when it's an ingrained part of you and it, 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 it uh, drives your responses and your feelings and your actions and your intents day after day after day, year after year, because it is a part of you. See, that ego that, that defines you is the problem because you now have an emotional reaction because you lose somebody or, you know, something else happens, you know, in your life, uh, you, you don't uh, get the job that you thought you were going to get or, you know, your cat dies or some other sort of thing that happens um, or you don't get accepted to that school you wanted to get accepted to. There's still now, there's a little grieving there. There's some emotion and you can feel bad about that. You can feel upset about that. And that's okay because it's temporary. As long as it's temporary, it's not really a problem in your growth. It's not like, oh, nobody should ever cry at a funeral because that's ego and ego's bad. That's silly. No, don't, you know, that's, that's not the way it is at all. If you're upset, cry if you're upset. That's authentic. If you're really bothered because things aren't the way you want them, you know, you can cry about that. Things aren't the way I, I want them. But if you let that go on, Define. if that begins to drive your life, you see, now it's not temporary. Now it is a problem. Now you do have to deal with it and you're going to have to get rid of it to that extent. So things that are temporary reactions to things, they're not life drivers and they're not really all that important. And yes, they're ego, but it's authentic. It's real. It's you. You have that ego. Things aren't the way you want them and that upsets you. All right. Go have a good boohoo and, you know, get over it and then learn to let it go and live without it. You know, you have to, things happen and now you, you have, have to deal, deal with, with them. them. That, that includes, includes bad, bad things, things that happen, that happen like, like death, death and, 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 and uh, you know, here. lost positions and jobs and things. And then you go on. You have to let it go. So as long as you don't let it run your life, as long as it isn't there for months and months and years, and we all know people that are like that, that have a, you know, a relationship a problem. And it might not have been that a person died. It may have just, they broke up, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And five years later, see, that's still gnawing at them. It's still a problem. Well, that's because they're probably, it's not just the breaking up, but that breaking up, they probably have some kind of guilt or inadequacy or some other kind of thing that runs deeper into ego of a different sort is what keeps that alive for so long. And that's not healthy. So temporary sadness, ego, um, not a big deal. Sure, it's okay. Just have it and learn to grow to the point that you can accept what's happened and deal with it successfully. But you got to deal with it. It's not like, well, mm -hmm. I'll deal with it over the next 10 years. Well, now that is a problem. You see, or I deal with it. Uh, I'll never deal with it. I'll always have this, this issue. Well, you need to let that go. That'll just drag you down. If you've got so many of these issues, each one's like a weight. And that mm -hmm. weight's attached to you. And pretty soon, if you have weights attached to you all over because of all these things you hold on to, then um, you're not going to be a very happy person. You're going to be one of these perpetually sad, unhappy people that uh, always feel that, you know, life is just too horrible. Mm -hmm. It's just not fun. You don't want to go on. And that's called depression. 
So you have to just get over things. And some things are hard to get over. You know, I can imagine there's some very, you know, when a, when a child dies, right. okay, when a young child dies, you can almost guarantee that the parents will feel guilty because after all, a young child, they were in charge of, you know, mm -hmm. its safety and everything else. And then they failed because you see, and no matter what the circumstances were, even if the parents, you know, did everything in due diligence, were the perfect parents, took every precaution, things still happen. And people yeah. still feel guilty, whether they're really guilty of anything or not. They just feel that way. So those are hard issues to deal with, but you need to be able to accept it. It did happen. And whatever parts you had in it, well, I was gonna go in there and check them, but I didn't because I was just too tired myself. And then, you know, something happens. But you have to let that go and say, that is the way it happened. Now, my job is to deal with that, learn from it, and grow up because of it, not to let it drag me down, right. and which drags everybody else down around me, of course, you know, not to do that because that's, that's hurtful. That's not good for you. That doesn't help you grow up. So ego is not a problem in small doses for specific reasons. That's no, you know, it doesn't have any long-term difficulty for you. That ego you carry around forever, or you carry it around deep, you know, that, that uh, sort of like the hand, you know, the, the hand up your back that makes you react to things the way you do, you know, that gives you all those triggers. That's the problem. Right. Trying at a, web, a wedding doesn't, doesn't produce a trigger for you. you know, it shouldn't produce a trigger for you. It's just an experience, right. and it's okay. You know, I think when it comes to death, and I know this is a little off topic because really we were talking about ego, but, you know, it's hard for us, I guess it's hard for us not to sympathize in what happened to that other person. It's like, I hear what you're saying with regards to a child, but, you know, a lot of people get, you know, very emotionally charged when you think of, you know, somebody murdered or raped or, you know, that kind of thing. And when it happens to a child or when, like, there's all these, but what if, and the thing is, is that we're focusing, like, it really has nothing to do with that other person. Just like you said, it really has to do with our ego and how, how it sort of made us react from a different place. Like a lot of people have abandonment issues. So when something like a murder happens or a death or, you know, we kind of get triggered from our own abandonment issue, regardless of how close they are, but it, it's like this charge to it that, you know, oh, we don't see that that person just gets to transition to a different form. We think they're somehow now never going to be, you know, that energy is no, no longer exists and, you know, we're never going to feel that person again. And it's, it's, again, it's, it's coming from this place of me instead right, of, right. right. Exactly. Right. It's coming from, it's all ego. It's things aren't the way I want them. I don't and want those so things to happen. I don't angry. want them to happen to other people. I don't want them to happen to, you know, even people on the other side of the planet. And it upsets me when I see these poor people, you know, being pushed around by soldiers or whatever, you know, those things, then people have very strong emotions for that. Well, it's good to have empathy. It's good to see that situation. It's good to see what's wrong with it. What's, you know, how did it happen? Why is it like that? It's good to understand those. We're not thinking, you know, oh, just you know, oh, well, that's the way it is, go on. No, that's not what we mean. It's good to understand it, but it, it, if it's about you, because now you feel frightened, now you feel hurt, because it's not, it shouldn't be that way. You know, if that's right. your idea, well, it's not fair, you see, right. that kind of thing. It's just not right. Well, that's indignation. And that indignation is just your ego. You have to deal basically with, understanding things the way they are, accepting the things you can't change, changing the things you can, <laughs> and always trying to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. If that mm -hmm. makes you angry, and now you watch videos and people are being abused and you're angry about it, 
Well, now you're part of the problem. Right. You see, anger, fear, ego, that's part of the problem. If you get down to the basics, the reason those horrible things are happening to those people is because of somebody's ego, somebody's, you know, fear, somebody's thinking about what they're going to get out of it. Uh, you know, that arrogance, that's all ego, that's all fear. So now you let that push you into being more fearful, you know, more ego, anger. Well, now you've just added to the problem. <laughs> well, no, you haven't gone out and abused somebody. But still, you're adding, you know, you're adding negative things into our into our being here, into our into our culture, into our world, and we need to get rid of that negative stuff, not add to it. That's right. like when the when the guy says there's no bologna in the refrigerator, and then <laughs> his wife gets angry, then he gets angry at the wife because she got angry, and then he gets she gets angry at him because he's angry now for her being angry, and pretty soon they're not talking to each other and having a big fight. You see. And in her mind, he was really being rude and, and didn't seem to give her any respect. And in his mind, he was attacked mm -hmm. for no particular reason. Mm -hmm. And that never comes out. The reality mm -hmm. of the situation is never understood. All that's left is anger. That doesn't help. It really doesn't help. So it's the same if you've seen, you know, people get bullied somewhere. Well, that should make you think. You should have empathy for that. And you should understand how that came about. What's wrong there? Those are important lessons to understand. You don't just pass it off. You learn from it. Well, you know, why is that like that? What's the, what was the, you know, what are, was all the causal things that led to it? And what you'll find generally on both sides is ego, fear, fear, ego, belief. You know, that's what was, that's what causes it. That's the problem. And now what do you do in reaction to that? More fear, <laughs> you know, more, more, uh, you know, more ego, more belief. So right. that is not helpful at all. <laughs> right. Perfect. All right. Last question. So last question has to do with, um, <laughs> can we feel energy from our clothes? And I, I, I mean, I, well, personally, I do a lot of clearing work and I've never had to clear clothes, but I think, I think you came from it from a different perspective, which I really liked. So let's talk about that. Okay. Well, you know, if you uh, get somebody's clothes, let's say you buy, uh, you go into a second shop and you buy stuff that somebody used to own, you know, and is there a problem with getting some of the energy of that person that used <laughs> to own it, you know, and gets on you or, you know, affects you some way? Well, um, that's similar to a bigger question, which can objects, can things carry specific energies? You know, like an old relic. You can have an you know, old relic that was owned by some Egyptian sometime, you see, does that carry special significance, special energy, or crystals are supposed to have specific energies. Oh, have this crystal will make you calm and that crystal will make you something else. Uh, you know, they change things because of the energy and you can put energy into a special symbols like wedding ring or, uh, you mm -hmm. know, a Christian cross or, you know, there's all kinds of symbols that you can invest en energy, energy in. in. And, and now, now I, can I can take, take this Christian cross and go in and chase vampires away because, <laughs> you know, they fear it because of its energy that it yes. has. So we have this idea that objects indeed can hold and have energy. And the reason we have that idea is that it's true. You can pick up an artifact of some sort and you can get some information on, you know, things about that artifact, where it's been, you know, what was its function, how it was used, the people that used it, but you're not getting that from the artifact. The mm -hmm. artifact makes you ask the question, oh, I wonder who owned this before. I wonder what they were like. I wonder what this was used for. How did, you know, how did it come about to be in this place at this time? You're asking questions. And when you ask those kinds of questions, then you kind of just leave space for an answer. Uh -huh. What you're doing is querying a database. So you ask the question and you pause, leave a little space for an answer. Oh, and images come or things come and you get some idea. That's called psychotronics. And that's using your mind to intuit things you know, things that happened around objects. 
all you're doing is querying the database. You're asking a question and you're waiting for an answer and you get the answer. It's not that that information is somehow tied to that thing and is part of the energy of that thing. It doesn't work that way. That thing's just a thing. It's a virtual thing. It doesn't have memory. You see, right. it's a, what is that thing? Let's say it's a, it's a ring that was owned by the Pharaoh or something. You see, that's, that's a ring. And you can trace that back and see where it came from, how it was made, even the stone that was queried, you know, to make it. And you can get all that because you're getting it out of the database. That <laughs> ring is a virtual ring. It's ones and zeros on a hard drive someplace. It's just a virtual ring as are all objects, including the clothes. This is a virtual reality. It's just virtual stuff. It's ones and zeros on a hard drive. It's some, it's a data, you know, it's data in a data stream that consciousness gets that they interpret as this physical reality. It doesn't have any memory. It doesn't have any energy. There is no energy. Energy is a metaphor. You see, so right. when you see it that way, then no, things don't have energy, but people do. Consciousness <laughs> does. So if you go into a house and somebody tells you, you know, oh, that house, uh, you exactly. know, the last person that owned it, there was a big axe murder going on in there. And, you know, 12 people were found chopped up in there and uh, it's been on the market for 20 years and nobody <laughs> buys it. And now you buy it. And nobody told you that. Then you find out. Well, suddenly every, you know, you hear things, you feel things, you hear people scream in the night and all this stuff. That's because you have been given enough information that you wonder, you question, you feel, is there something there? How maybe the ghosts of these people are there? Well, as you have these intents and thoughts, you're liable to get information back. You see, you'll create that. You'll create that um, exchange, if you will. You'll create the ghosts. You'll create other things because now you are interactive with that possibility. So that becomes part of your data stream. And you may even see that ghost walking through your room, you know, with an ax in hand. Well, all that is data in your data stream. You see, it's not physical. It's not there. And if nobody had told you a thing about it, you probably would never have that reaction to it. But it's still possible you might. It's just not as likely. Because if everybody else around that area knows about it, they're all thinking about it too. And they're saying, oh, those new people from New York, they came down here and didn't have any idea. And they bought the old Smith place, you know, that's haunted. Well, if thousands of people around you have that in their mind and wondering about how those New Yorkers are getting along there in that old house, well, that may be part, you know, we have, we have conscious to consciousness communication all the time. That may actually create something, but it's all coming out of the minds of people. It's not because places are inhabited. And when you go in and you cleanse a place, you clear it, what you're doing is you are providing not only information, but information with a couple of exclamation points after it that says, it's okay now. This, this house is, this is okay. This space doesn't have that problem anymore. And when the people who have hired you hear that, then they feel better. And when they feel better, they let those things go. When they let those things go, well, it doesn't happen anymore. You see? So that's, you know, that's how, how those, those things, things work. work. What, what you're, you're doing, doing is you're, you're modifying their thinking process and you interact with them. If you just came into their house and they didn't know about it, you, you know, you knew these people had a haunted house and you were going to go and clear it for them, but you didn't say anything to them. You broke into their house, you cleared it for them, <laughs> and then you left and nobody could tell you were ever there, right? It probably wouldn't have worked. <laughs> you see? It just wouldn't have worked because part of what you do is communicate with the other people, explain to them what you're doing. And, oh, yeah, I felt this over here. Oh, well, then they say she knows. She connected with it. Okay, that's good because, see, they couldn't connect with it. They're just frightened by it. All right, now you're moving them out or you're doing this and you're doing that. Well, you're giving them process to lead them to an understanding that it's gone because of your process. If you just walked in and said, okay, click my fingers, it's gone, no problem. That'll be $100, please, and then leave, it probably wouldn't work, you see, because you didn't lead them through any process that helps them feel like 
now it's not a problem anymore. So that's what's going on. It's really, it's consciousness is the active ingredient, not the thing, the stuff. Now, can the larger consciousness system put data in your data stream that looks like a ghost? Sure, it can do that. And would there be some reason for that? Oh, maybe sometimes, maybe it help open people's eyes to a larger reality. There may be other things. So it's not just that people imagine it, it can be there, you know, outside of their imagination. I'm not saying these things are only imagined. That's not it at all. Right. I'm saying they're all mental. They're all in consciousness. They're not in physical stuff. Right. It's all in data stream. And by doing the things that you do with your intent, when you go clear place, you're using your intent to modify their data stream. Hmm. You're using your intent to put them in a different space, to clear that data stream, if you will, from giving them the data with that bad stuff in it. So that's what's going on. And you can do that. That's, that's the thing. Your intent modifies future probability. And if you have confidence and you're working from, you know, from your soul level, from the being level, then you can modify that future probability to the point that they don't get that in their data stream anymore. So in a real, in a real sense, you are clearing that for them. Right. But it's not like there's this stuff out there that you're shooing away. What you're clearing is all in consciousness because consciousness is where everything is. There's mm -hmm. nothing out there anyway. It's a virtual reality, you see. So all the activity, all the, all the work, all the change is going on at the consciousness level. It's not going on at the physical level. We just think it is going on at the physical level because that helps us focus. It helps mm -hmm. us focus our intent. It gives us a process to work. You see, so we kind of think of it that way, but those are tools. And you know, there'll be people who clear houses and they all have different tool sets. Mm -hmm. They have tool sets that they've grown up with. You know, some sprinkle holy water, you know, mm -hmm. some do this, you know, some light candles, some say prayer, some, you know, they have all kinds of tools. The tools are irrelevant. It's what they do with their conscious intent. And those tools help them focus that intent to do it because all the changes are in the realm of consciousness, mm -hmm. not in the realm of physicality. There is nothing in, the, in this realm of physicality. It's just information in consciousness and data streams. Yes. So that's how those things work. So this crystal will help you have calmness. If you think this crystal helps you have calmness <laughs> and every time this crystal comes near to you, you go, ah, I feel so much calmer. Then that will work. You'll have that as an association. And that crystal comes around, you'll associate that with calmness. And when you do, what, what you're, you're saying, saying is, is I, feel I feel calm. calm. I want to be calm. Let go of all the stress. Okay, let that go. This crystal helps me do that. Well, the crystal's just a tool to help you focus your intent on the calmness. Right. You see, it's not the crystal that causes you to be calm. The crystal causes you to focus your intent on being calm. It's your intent that is actually doing it. But if you don't have this process to go through, if you can't go get your calming crystal and then feel <laughs> calm, then you can't do it yourself because you don't feel like you have that kind of skill or ability. If I just, you know, if I could just tried to be calm, it wouldn't work. <laughs> but if I go get my calming crystal, that works. It's just a tool to help you focus your intent. And the tool has to have some process to it. Otherwise we don't believe it. Right. See, you just walk in and say, snap my fingers. <laughs> all right. All the ghosts are gone. See you later. Give me a hundred bucks. <laughs> Nobody would believe it. You see, there's not enough process there to create change in consciousness. So the process though, isn't real. It isn't actual. I mean, it doesn't really do anything other than it helps build, kind of helps change consciousness. Look at things in a different way. So hmm. that's the way bringing the calming crystal in and makes you feel calmer because now it allows you to have confidence and an intent that you can let that, that frustration go or whatever. So you do feel better when that calming crystal is around, you see, but that could be a, it could be a wash bucket instead of a crystal. Whenever I put this wash bucket here, I feel calm. And if you made that association, it would work just as well. You see, it's not the crystal, it's the association. 
well, we won't make associations with wash buckets because, wow, that's ridiculous. What could a wash bucket do with that? Thing? The crystals, <laughs> they're kind of nifty and, and so on. So we can make an association with them. And people can charge a great deal of money for these crystals, so they must be doing something, right? But oh, that's sure. an interesting thing. So that th this could yeah. lead to a another show, I'm thinking, that we'll, we'll expand on the different this is this has led me to some more questions so we'll leave that okay. till next week but, or next right. month but that was that was some interesting information i'm yeah. sure i've heard it somewhat sort of before but no this came in a different <laughs> way that i i haven't heard so i'm looking you forward know that, to that, that price on the crystal actually makes it work better <laughs> well of course if the crystal only cost a penny it probably wouldn't work worth a damn no nope. if it cost you know four hundred dollars It'll work every time, you see, it, because it's just building confidence. There's something there. It's important. It works. People value it. And that allows a person then to change themselves because they have this age, you see. They're not yes. really, if they just had to change themselves, oh, they'd be helpless. But with this age, they can do it. Yeah. That's like uh, Dumbo and his feather, right? Didn't Dumbo have a little feather in his <laughs> trunk true. that helped him fly? Yes, yes it worked the same way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, he had a feather that helped him fly. And that changes the way we see things. It changes our intent. It changes our, our possibilities. You see, without that crystal nearby with calming energy, I don't have the ability to just calm myself. But with that, I can. So it gives you an ability to refocus your mind in a different way. New possibilities arise. I've got a possibility of calmness now, whereas before I didn't because my crystal's here. Mm -hmm. Well, once that opens up a possibility and you put energy, if you will, energy is a metaphor too, but if you invest mm -hmm. your, your, your intent into that possibility, it starts to happen. It starts to come true. What you're doing is changing your mental space, your mental state, or your state of consciousness starts to change. And when it does, then you see things differently. You feel differently. So that's what's going on. So yes, if you get somebody's clothes, and then sometime after you got those clothes, you start feeling anxious about things. And then you think, wow, I bet it was those clothes. <laughs> now you've made an association. And once you've made that association, those clothes will probably make you anxious whenever you wear them or whenever you're around them and you will have this need to get rid of them and get them out of your closet because they're just got bad energy. You see, well, the bad energy is an association you made with them. And <laughs> it may have been because you found out it was that mean, that mean little lady on the corner, you know, who put those clothes there. Or it may be that just something happened to you to put you in a bad mood and you associated it with those clothes. Just an association, just a random association. And once that happens, sure enough, those clothes can cause you trouble. So you say, you know, if you'd say, well, people who think that those clothes they got are actually influencing them, causing them trouble. Well, that's true. <laughs> they are. But it's not that the clothes are doing it. They've gotten into a relationship with the clothes where they're doing that to themselves is really what's going on. But it doesn't mean they're imagining it. Sure enough, whenever they have those clothes on, you know, they're more aggravated than not. Yes, that's a, it's a, it's a real thing. But it doesn't mean that it's the clothes that are the, the active ingredient. It's the consciousness is always the active ingredient. The clothes are just the, the trigger, the connection, the, the process in which the intent and thoughts change. And we're very susceptible to our thoughts. Our thoughts, our imagination is a very powerful thing. Yeah. We're consciousness and the things that we think and the way we feel about things are very powerful. They, they uh, change us all together. <laughs> and we can, you know, it's the same thing with the, you know, with the lady whose husband says there's no bologna in the refrigerator. The reason she gets angry isn't because there's anything to get angry about. It's because in her mind, she's created something to get angry about. You see, the mind is very powerful. The things you think, the things you believe, the things, you know, that you make associations, that's your reality. In her reality, the husband was very rude and accused her of failure. That's in her reality, not his reality. And this person that has the clothes that make them unsettled when they wear them, well, that's in their reality. 
And they create that because they had that thought. And once the thought gets associated and connected, then there it is. It's a, it's a real thing. The only thing to do is get rid of those clothes <laughs> or just shake your head and let go of the association. And then it doesn't happen. You see, that's why people who are very sensitive people and very uh, open people will have all kinds of issues like that. It's not only clothes, but it's all sorts of things in their life. And people who are very, um, you know, scientific, very left brain, they go, oh, nonsense. <laughs> you know, ah, the clothes not going to do anything to you. You know, nonsense. It's not like that at all. For them, it never happens. You see, for them, clothes never make them angry. For them, all these association things never take place. They don't experience that energy that's in clothes. Well, how come the energy isn't in clothes for them, but it is for this other person? You see, mm -hmm. it's not the clothes. If you don't accept that, you don't make the associations, then you never experience that. If you're prone to making those kinds of associations, your whole life has a lot of magic in it because there's a lot of things that affect your mood and affect this and affect that. And, uh, you know, your horoscope isn't quite right for doing this today. <laughs> and you have lots of things that, uh, inter you know, very interactive with you and your feelings and what's going on in your life. And they are very <laughs> interactive. And if somebody says, oh, you're just imagining it all, you say, no, I'm not. I know these things really do influence me. They are real things that, and they're right. It is really influencing you, but it's not the things. It's the attachment to the things. It's the beliefs. It's the it's the connection of consciousness. That's the that's really the the active ingredient, not the stuff. Stuff is just stuff. It's virtual stuff. It doesn't even exist except as in data streams to consciousness. Now I know I've just probably thrown cold water on at least you know ten thousand people who are gonna who are gonna read this, but. Uh, so just, you know, it's Tom Campbell's opinion. If you don't like it, we'll just throw it out. What does he know? You know it's don't uh, get wired. Don't get wrapped up around it. You know, it's not uh, just go on, live your life the way you're living it. That's fine. Everybody lives their own life in their own reality. And that's the way it should be. Right. Well, so I, it's think, not a matter of being I think we're right going to have a follow-up show on this because I think it, 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 it made me think of a whole bunch of things that, um, yeah, so we're going to do a follow-up show on this because it made me think about healing and different things. It's it's we're gonna we're gonna do follow-up on this. So uh, if you have questions and you want to know, you know, how our consciousness affects us, that's that's kind of what we're going to look at uh, next month. So thank you, Tom. All, as always, this has been a, a very interesting show. I'm glad we took questions and uh, explored them because it it brought up some. Yeah, brought up some material placed in a different way. So I appreciate it. And yeah, I uh, I can see how the work I do specifically around the clearing is is doing exactly what you talked about with its consciousness. And we can talk again a little bit more about that next month because I it really brought up a lot of different stuff. But thank okay, you very yeah. much, Tom, as You're always. Welcome. If you want to know more about Tom, go to his website, My Big Toe. He has a forum. He has hundreds of YouTube videos, and now mine are being included with them. So uh, take advantage of all this because uh, he is a wealth of knowledge that uh, that many people can benefit from. So um, I look forward to having our show every month, and uh, we will we will talk next month. So thank you again, Tom. Mm -hmm. Well, well, the next like month, it'll be something to look forward to. It'll be fun. We'll talk about uh, how intent modifies future probability. That's how you heal. And it's also how somebody else's clothes make you feel itchy. There you know, you go. It's, it's the same process. It's, uh, it's intent modifying future probability. And we awesome. can discuss that uh, next time. That'll be fun. That will be fun. All right. So until next month, you've been listening to News for the Heart, and we've been getting to the heart of what matters. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Have a question for Lori and want to be on the next News from the Heart show? Drop us a line via instant feedback at bmajor.org. News from the Heart is brought to you by Intuitive Soul and is produced by Major Radio for Clear Channel's iHeartRadio and bmajor.org.